Welcome to Next to Madison, a podcast to help you live your best life. Welcome back. Another fun episode of Next to Madison. This is episode 150. We are talking about money on uh, this podcast. And my guest is going to talk about his new company, uh, how you could possibly get involved, how they're changing uh, kind of how capital is raised for new companies. If you're an entrepreneur, definitely, definitely take notes during this episode because there's new ways to be able to raise uh, working capital for your company. So that's very exciting. Uh, We're also going to kind of go through some of the things, obviously inflation's out of control. And a lot of people, if you don't have a really good wealth manager, are saying, how do I protect myself during this time? How do I utilize this downturn to make more money. Uh, What the heck is a black swan event? All these different financial terms that you're probably hearing thrown out on the news. But what's most important is, is keeping as much of your money as possible and being able to earn on it. So we'll kind of go through those different things, but we'll talk mainly kind of about his company, the blockchain, while why digital digital currency, um, is kind of the future, not the ones the government's talking about. I am not for those CBDCs, whatever they're called. Talking digital, more like cryptocurrency, where a lot of people can get involved and it's not just limited to accredited investors, so to say. So I am all for educating people and having everybody have a fair, equal playing field. And if you want to invest and take that risk, that's on you. Again, this is not financial advice. I am not a registered financial advisor, so please always do your own research, invest at your own risk. As I've said with crypto, love crypto, but obviously don't invest in something that you're not absolutely passionate about and never invest more than you can lose. So let's, uh, yeah, enough uh, enough of me talking, but before I, I go for our quick break, before we bring our guest on, Please, uh, just a reminder to please, please subscribe, uh, rate, and review us if you haven't. Those ratings and those reviews really help us get discovered. Also, those reviews help us know what you guys really love about the show. So, yeah, please do that. Love you all, and I appreciate each and every one of you tuning into this podcast. We couldn't do it without you. We have got Carlos Domingo with us. How are you? I'm fine. Thanks for the invite to your podcast. Yes, thank you. And so you guys, Carlos is the CEO and founder of a company called Securitize. Their website is www.securitize.io. And he's going to tell us about what Securitize does and why you as either an institutional investor, because we have some of those listeners, or a retail investor should uh, be excited about this. So you got the floor. Good. So what we do is we operate on a part of the, the digital asset ecosystem. <laughs> that deals with securities. Uh, since I've, you, you brought out people from from crypto and digital assets into the into the podcast, <clears throat> you probably you know the audience probably learned that digital assets are these native digital representations, which sometimes are referred as tokens that represent something. Right? In some case, it could be a currency. In some other case, it could be <clears throat> a collectible through NFTs that are now becoming very popular. It could be some token that gives you access to some services and has some utility. And there's some tokens uh, or some digital assets <clears throat> that actually represent securities. Securities meaning equity in a company, uh, debt uh, in a business. Um, they basically represent real world assets, which in most of the cases this is uh, governed by securities regulations. So, so we specialize on this asset class called digital asset securities, which are you know, native representations of securities in digital form using blockchain technology. Okay. Wonderful. And so you guys have a platform that allows both institutional and retail investors to invest in alternative assets. Is that correct? That's correct. So within the, the, the world of securities is divided kind of in like two types of securities, right? Some securities are what's called public securities, let's say like Apple shares or Uber shares. And for the most part, those are accessible to people, right? You can go and open a Robinhood account and then you're trading Apple shares. There's a, there's a ton of things happen behind the scenes that are very inefficient, that people are not aware of it. But from, from an investment perspective, whether you're institutional or retail, you want to buy Apple shares, and there's a million ways of buying Apple shares. Now, there is a whole other side of the securities world uh, called alternative assets, or which are typically private securities. So these are securities that are not registered with the regulator. They're legal. There's not that they're illegal, but they're just not registered with the SEC. 
and that you know typically get exposure to alternative assets so private equity real estate equity and startups um you know venture capital etc and what has happened in the industry is that the alternative asset industry has actually grown faster the last 10 years than the public uh, securities because the companies don't go public anymore right they think they go public much later so they stay private and there's a lot of private funds investing in private companies and real estate etc and that part of the market which is very profitable by the way so the returns on, on alternative assets are better than, than on public securities is very inaccessible it's very difficult to invest uh, it has a lot of problems in terms of you know, intermediaries is not digitized, it's very illiquid, which is problematic for retail investors, etc. So our platform focuses on basically making alternative assets and private capital markets more accessible. Which is amazing because so many people think that if they just want to invest, they can only invest in publicly traded companies through their Which is true for the most part, right? right. <laughs> We're trying to change that. <laughs> yeah. And then you always hear, you know, oh, the big money's in private equity or the big money's in venture capital because they get there before they break out and they have their IPOs. Um, so and it's actually true, by the way, like the, the, the best performing private equity firms, they say like KKR or somebody like that, they will only sell, you know, investments to institutional investors. They will not sell to retail. So if you're a retail investor, you don't have access to the best performing you know, real estate funds or private equity funds. They are not accessible to all VC funds, like VC funds will not sell LP interest on a VC uh, to retail investors, so. Well, exactly, and that's what can be frustrating to everyday investors is, is you know, you gotta know the right person to be able to make money. It's always, you gotta make ha have money to make money type thing, or know uh -huh. the right people. You know, your uncle started a business, maybe you can get in that way. But now it sounds like with your company, you're actually going to allow everyday investors, retail investors, to actually participate in these basically pre-IPO alternative investments. Is that correct? Correct. So, so if you think about what, what, let's go one step back. Let's think about what blockchain is, right? So, and let's put it on the context of what internet did. So, if you think about what happened with internet, uh, let's say before internet existed, if you wanted to distribute your content, you don't even have a good way to do it, right? You have to be a big broadcaster, um, and it didn't allow like you know individual producers like you uh, to distribute your content in an efficient way, right? And suddenly, internet became this very efficient two-sided marketplace that allowed you to become your own producer and your own distributor of your own content, right? Mm -hmm. And the same thing happened to I don't know advertising, right? Like before internet existed, if you had a small restaurant in the corner of Miami, you couldn't advertise, right? Like what could you? You're not going to put a TV ad. You're not going to go into a newspaper, national newspaper. So internet basically created again this very very efficient platform to be able to distribute uh you know internet and to sorry, advertising to the right people and you can pick you know content advertising you know commerce uh you know payments deliveries like so many industries have been disrupted by this you know very very efficient public utility if you want yeah. that that matches you know demand with supply right mm -hmm. so if you think about what blockchain does as opposed to, let's say, the web 2.0 on the internet is basically, it's not a public utility, it's, it's a, you know, some, some infrastructure that is out there that anybody can use, that does one particular thing very well that the internet didn't do, which is transact with something that represents value, right? So um, just to give simple examples that people can understand, I can buy a Picasso and then I can get an NFT that represents the ownership in the Picasso. I can just transfer the NFT from me to you through a wallet, and then suddenly you are actually on the Picasso. Uh, the same thing we can happen with securities. I can purchase a token that represents, let's say, shares in a private equity fund, and then I can transfer it to you, or I can, you know, do many things that you know transact with value, right? Value could be money, could be securities, could be collectibles, could be art, could be anything. So, so this very efficient platform, what our belief uh, is that is going to open up the long tail of capital markets. So access to capital markets as people never had before, right? Because suddenly you have this very efficient way of doing it. So that's the whole thesis of you know, what our company does, is how we can democratize access to capital markets. So, so people can you know, efficiently participate on them, purchase equity in, in private equity or in startups, startups can raise money and all that, that things that capital markets do, right? Yeah. And it's easy for them to keep track because it's now on the blockchain. Correct. The blockchain gives you many advantages, right? It actually gives you not just traceability, right? But you can actually prove ownership. Um, because people don't realize that in, in, in traditional capital markets, it's very hard to prove ownership of something. Like if, let's say, if you, if you want to prove to me that you own your company, how are you going to do it? 
you probably have to show me some sort of paperwork, right? That, that at some point in time you incorporated the company and you have the shares. But that doesn't necessarily prove your ownership, right? Because maybe you sold the company after that and the paperwork hasn't been updated. So it's very hard to actually prove ownership of something in, in capital markets. Um, the same thing happens in some public markets, right? Even if you, if you have, let's say, Robinhood, I don't know, Apple shares on your Robinhood account, that actually doesn't mean that you actually own them, right? So you have to go to your broker dealer, the broker dealer probably, people, most people don't know, but those shares are actually not under your name, they're under the name of your broker dealer. And, you know, there's all, all this convoluted system of intermediaries to prove ownership on, on things. So, so what blockchain does is this very, very efficient public ledger where you can, you know, use digital assets and tokens to basically represent ownership and transact with it. So, so that's one of the first problems that solves, like how do I prove I actually purchased something and own something? <laughs> I mean, and that's amazing. So how did you, what was kind of the pivotal moment in, in your career? Because you have a finance background, like, to, to start this company. Actually, I don't have finance background. <laughs> but, yeah, okay. I well, you sound don't. very knowledgeable. <laughs> <laughs> I have a PhD in computer science. So I'm a geek. I come from technology. I've been building products all my career. When I started in this industry, I had no idea about finance. I just saw in 2016 a very cool technology that I figured out you you're going to be able to do new stuff with it, primarily with things that represent value, right? Because that was kind of like the main thing. So all the, you know, the last four years, people laugh at me because they say you become a mix of a, of a lawyer and a Wall Street person because I had to learn all these regulations and terminology and, you know, financial services, products and infrastructure, which for me has been fascinating, right? Because it's something I had no idea before. But my actual background is technology and building products and that's what primarily I do at the, at the company, so. Well, that is so cool. And so when you got into this whole like blockchain thing, so the, the, your partners and you, you obviously saw a need for everyday people to have access to capital markets. Yeah, I'll, I'll tell you how the, the pivotal moment, if you want, was. So because I've been in technology all my career, I've obviously dealt with venture capital, right? Either because I was raised money from my companies or because I've invested in other companies or because I've invested in, in VC firms, et cetera. And venture capital as an asset class is like this super well-performing asset class, right? Like if you look at the last 10 years, like where people have made a ton of money is with venture capital because you invest very early on a company that I was just having lunch with one of my investors. He said, this uh, guy that invested in this company that when he when did the seat around and it's worth three, it was two, worth three a million. And I think it's now four, five, six years after the company is worth two billion. So the guy has done a thousand X which is unheard of, right? Like there is very few other places where you can actually get those multiples. So if you think about the people that invested very early on on Amazon or Google or Facebook or Uber, they've made a ton of money, right? And that typically is, you know, obviously friends and families, but, but also VCs, right? VCs that for a living and, and then, you know, investing in venture capital is something that could be very lucrative, right? Mm -hmm. Now there's two problems about why it's not a popular thing to do or it's not a simple thing to do. The first problem is that, <clears throat> you know, VCs, and because, you know, they cannot actually take very small tickets, right? Because if they take small tickets and they want to raise, you know, $100 million, they're going to go crazy. They're going to have thousands of investors. So from a regulatory perspective, it's complicated from a paper trail of who put how much money and when you need to distribute money because you sold one of the companies, how do you do the payouts? And like, it's a nightmare, right? So most VCs, what they try to do is to keep, you know, the amount of investors on a venture capital firm uh, as a very small number. And then the second thing is they do... You know, VCs don't spend all the money up front, right? Um, they, they, you know, they raise a fund, let's say 100 million fund, and they invest all those 100 million across four or five years. And the way it works in the industry is that you, if you commit, let's say, $1 million to a VC fund, you don't give them the money up front. You, you, they call the money skull. So, like, every year they'll call you $200,000 until they collected the $1 million because they, if they call the money and they park it in the bank, the, bank, the money is not producing any any value, right? Because it hasn't been invested yet. So, so they just let you keep it and because they think it's more favorable because then you can, you know, invest it somewhere else. Now, the problem with that is that that's a tricky thing because if at some point in time, let's say three years after, suddenly you've moved out of to a different house and, and then you had to buy a bigger house and then suddenly they do one of these capital calls and they ask you, oh, you remember you owe me now $300,000 and you don't have them, you, you have a problem, right? And you probably lose all the investment you've done in the past. So capital calls, are problematic for individual investors. So we have to think first, let's summarize. First is that the, the minimum ticket size is very high because they want few investors. So typically you have to have a lot of money. Second, they have this capital call issue. So you always have to have some money reserved to do the investment. And the third one is that venture capital 
it has very good returns, but it takes very long time because companies go public very late and then therefore there's no liquidity, right? So you might be a thousand X on paper, but it doesn't mean that you've actually made a thousand X. You have to wait for something to happen, right? Like either a company goes public or it gets acquired and at that point in time is when your, you know, your, your investment materializes, right? So these three things make it impossible for normal people to invest. It's just too problematic. You don't have enough money for it or you don't want to take the risk of capital calls or you might need liquidity because, you know, individual investors, you get married, you have kids, you get divorced. Like there's so many things that can happen. You have to change, you know, go to a different place to live because of work. And, and then you, you can't just rely on, on having your money on illiquid assets. It has to be something that if you need the money, you can sell it and then use it, right? So, so that was the problem we had. Like we thought venture capital should be more accessible, more, you know, we should figure out how to democratize it. And then when the whole blockchain thing started and people started issuing tokens and doing, uh, you know, uh, digital assets on the blockchain, we've, we then realized, well, venture capital is actually the, the right, let's say, area to focus to basically be able to use this, you know, let's say long tail of capital markets platform to solve those problems. So. I mean, this is, this is exciting stuff. And if you're if you're listening out there and anything was confusing for you, go just rewind it and listen to it again because that was very fascinating. I mean, I understand like the venture capital world and kind of how that works, but it really is kind of it, you really broke it down very nicely. Um, but so now people will be able to directly participate without having those capital calls. They're just going to say, "Okay, I'm going to buy X amount of tokens." So I'm going to give you. Two thousand dollars. That's exactly how it works. That's you can all go, I have to commit. Yeah, yeah. You can go to securitized.io. Uh, you can. You have to create an ID. It's called securitized ID because we need to know who you are. So these uh, these are regulated products, obviously. Okay. <clears throat> so so you you create you create an account. Typically, it's a very simple process. You just submit your ID, your driver's license, or, or passport, or whatever. Most of the time, it gets approved automatically because we have like technology that. You know, verifies your name, your, you know, where you're based, and things like that. And then once the account is open, you go to a platform where you actually see tokens that are actually represent securities. In some cases, in, you know, a part of a VC fund, and you can buy as as low as ten dollars, twenty dollars, and and just go and purchase it. So you you prefund your account. You need to send some money. We can we take stable coins, we take ACH, we take wire, whatever, and then we take credit card now, which is introduced, <laughs> and then buy a piece of a VC. Uh, you know, without any of the disadvantages that we discussed before, right? So that there is no threshold. You can invest as low as one dollar, ten dollars. Capital calls are gone already, <clears throat> and then these tokens are liquid because then the same way that you're buying, you can also go back and sell them if you want after. Oh, so that's so. There's no lockup period. There's no lockup period at this point in time. There's no lockup. This is it might get a bit complicated from a regulatory perspective, but the, the securities, the security tokens that we trade in our platform are already outside any lockup period. So people can buy them and sell them like if they were public uh, stocks. Okay, and so is this the only platform that you can buy those particular products on? It's not the only one, but it's the best. It's okay. okay. <laughs> no, no, of course, there's other people trying to, <laughs> I was joking. There's other people trying to, select. this problem is, is massive, right? Because you, you have, you know, $10 trillion or $15 trillion of alternative assets that are not accessible to people. And if you think about, you know, how much, you know, money is out there that, you know, it doesn't have access to these assets. It's just massive. I'll give you an example. Yeah, forget about retails, but if you think about accredited investors, which are typically, you know, wealthy retail investors, so people yeah, like that. 200, what is it? Is it still 250,000 liquid cash? <laughs> yes, yeah, 200,000 of just, no, it's no liquid crisis. You add, your salary has to be $200,000 or combined between you and your wife, 200,000. Okay, gotcha. All right. I thought it Or, or you have, I think it's $1 million of liquid assets without counting your house or something like that. But okay. the point is that most people think, oh, well, this is only for accredited investors. Well, you know how many accredited investors are in the U.S.? How guess. Many? Guess, guess a number. A million. No, there is 13 million. A lot more than that. <laughs> <laughs> there is 13 million. Like last year, for the first time in history, more than 10% of the U.S. population became accredited. Well, yeah, so, we printed trillions. Exactly. <laughs> no, well, they, you, we, we printed trillions. We have inflation, but also salaries went up. Um, so people became more worthy overall. Like the, the, the accredited investor yeah. definition hasn't been updated for ages, right? And people are making more and more money over time. So nowadays, you know, besides retail, which obviously is much bigger, but accredited investors is 13 million more than 10% population. Not even those people 
have actually access to those products. And you know, collectively, these 13 million people, they manage around $75 trillion. That's the wealth that they, they have. So- $75 trillion? Tri yeah, $75 trillion. Wow, okay, so for, so, so for 30 million people, roughly 10% of the, a little under 10% of the US population is $75 trillion. That's correct. That's so, yeah. So the rate is a huge number, right? So if we figure out how to use this technology to mobilize that capital, which is not access, not, they don't have access to these products, it actually benefits both sides, right? It benefits these people because they suddenly have, you know, attractive investment opportunities that they didn't have before. But it also benefits the other guys, right? Like the guy that today only sells private equity or VC to, you know, the ultra wealthy or institutional investors suddenly has access to, you know, another pile of pool of capital that is inaccessible that they can also raise money, right? So it works both ways. They're not just that the retail investors, you asked me at the beginning, is this for retail or for our institutional? Well, it's both ways, right? Because you create this, this long tail of capital markets that allows you both retail investors to access, but also, you know, institutional people, asset managers to basically sell into that, uh, you know, that investor pool, which was not accessible. It's very similar to, if you think about advertising, <clears throat> or, or even, you know, let's say broadcasting as you, uh, since you're from, the, from this space, right? You know, you have now the ability to basically broadcast to your audience in a very efficient way, right? You as an individual, let's say, contributor. But it's also the other way around. Somebody like Netflix can actually send content to one person only, and it doesn't have to be, okay, you go to, you turn on a channel, and it's 5 p.m., and everybody has to see the same content. Yeah. So it, work, it works both ways. Uh, so... Well, I mean, th this is a very exciting stuff. So how do you vet the companies that come onto your platform? Well, we have a bunch of people that know more things than I don't know that, you know, evaluate the companies. We obviously check a lot that the uh, compliance and legal and, you know, it's a process. Uh, and there's people that are business experts in different domains that determine, okay, this is a good company. We're going to, uh, you know, take them and list them and, and we're going to allow people to trade with them. So, I mean, th that's amazing. And do you have any big um like private equity companies or vc companies that are investing through your platform into these other so that's an interesting question so when i started the company we founded the company in november 2017 okay so in pretty much in 2018 i just spent my life going up and down wall street talking to both the big banks and the big asset managers and at that time it was like zero appetite to do anything like i can tell you it was because we you know as i mentioned my background is it's technology, right? So I thought I was very naive thinking, oh, I'm just going to build this very cool platform and those guys are going to use it, right? Because to operate these platforms, you have to be a regulated entity. So we are a very heavily regulated entity. Yeah. So at the beginning, I thought like building technology is easier, right? You don't have to deal with regulators. You don't have to get licensed. You don't have to pay for all these things. And then after a year doing that, I kind of realized these guys are never going to move. They're not early adopters of technology. They're huge companies that this they perceive crypto at the time as a very risky, you know, a speculative asset class. So we went through a journey of like basically three years, like 19, 20, and 21 of basically getting all these licenses that allow us to us operate these platforms and sell these products and trade these products. And interestingly enough, after we did that and became a heavily, very heavy regulated company, now we are seeing all these guys that are basically coming and so we want to now start working with you guys because it basically we've proved that this works and that this is legal. Uh, to them, right? So, so I'm very excited about where we are, right? Because we're in this yeah. you know, transition point where the big banks and the big asset managers have basically capitulated and assumed that this is the future and that blockchain is the future and that they need to participate. Well, yeah, absolutely. They need to change or get left behind, right? No, this is this is so exciting. But yeah, it's always that thing. You no, nobody wants to be the fir first money in, right? Yeah, nobody wants to be, especially look for, uh, I, I used to work for a large telecommunications company in the past and then you know, there's two, there's two reasons why large corporations are not innovative, right? And sometimes there's no fault to anybody. One is because the, the, you know, the money that you're, you're going to make at the beginning is not worth the disruption you create. And I'll give you a very simple example in the context of telecommunications. So telecommunications companies used to make a lot of money with SMS, right? <clears throat> Just paying for messaging. Uh, and then when things like WhatsApp come up that were free, yeah. there was no incentive for them to do it, right? Because and they were cannibalizing their revenues, right? So if you think about large, let's say, banks that have very big wealth management distribution, those guys charge fees, right? And they charge high fees <laughs> to, to advise you what to do with your money. So suddenly, if you have a place where you can go and buy anything you want, 
by yourself and access to products that are inaccessible, then suddenly they're, they're being disintermediated, right? So, so the incentive to, to go there uh, is not going to be there. And vice versa is the same thing. If you're an asset manager, you're only selling to institutions, you are going to use one of these banks as an intermediary to sell, right? If suddenly the, the asset manager can actually sell directly to, let's say, individual investors, then you know the bank's not going to be happy with you. <laughs> and then you know, they, you're going to disintermediate them or they're going to stop distributing your product to their customers and go with somebody else, etc. So there's a lot of disincentives for these companies to be the first one. Because at the beginning, the, the risk-reward equation is not there, right? It's yeah. too much risk for something that is small. I mean, what we do is very small. Yet, so I'm hoping it's going to be huge, but at the moment, it's, the reality is just starting, right? So, so it has to be startups that are actually disrupt these industries. There's no way that large participants are, are going to be the ones doing it. Right? Yeah, it, it is. It, it, it's a disruptive technology, which is good. I think disruptive is a is a positive thing. You know, how can you make something better? You can't stay behind in the dinosaur years. I, you know, I'm a big fan of like DeFi, obviously, right? Because mm -hmm there's all these cool places you can go and you can transfer your fiat into more of a stable coin and you can get, you know, a five to six to seven to eight to 12% API. I mean, you'd have to be the really good wealth manager to guarantee that type of return uh -huh. year, over year over year. So I know, I know a lot of the traditional banks are starting to kind of freak out because everybody's getting their paycheck deposited and then ripping all of it, but $200 out going to these DeFi platforms. So do you think the banks are eventually going to change their model or are they so broken that they won't be able to compete and they'll eventually go away? This is my thought. Like what's going to happen to Bank of America? If Bank of America doesn't start paying a four to 7% interest on a savings account, why, how are they going to continue to stay in business if everybody goes to DeFi? Do you have any thoughts on this? Yeah, so look, first, there is a reason why these DeFi platforms give you such a high yield, right? It's because they also take, you know, there's a lot of risk involved in what they do, right? Yes, yield risk. So, so the risk profile is something people care, right? Like in, the, in I was reading an article, and it was actually like a 140 pages report about, you know, uh, fraud happening in crypto space. And surprisingly, not surprisingly, the, the one that has grown and is not the biggest one is DeFi. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, I think there is, there's two types of investors, right? It's the ones that they have the risk and they don't care about the, the you know, they, they have the, the, they're looking for these very high rewards and they don't care about the risk and then they'll go to a DeFi platform and they'll get this six, seven percent. And that is, they're the ones that, you know, because they don't understand very well what happens there and they know that there is risk involved that they're going to go to Bank of America. I think that the, something in the middle is, is going to emerge that this is what is going to be interesting, which are regulated products that give you to some extent the same yields that the DeFi companies give you but with a much more, you know, if you want a safer environment for you. Uh, but they are much better products than the ones that traditional finance do. So DeFi has another problem today, which is an important consideration. When you go to DeFi, you say you're a fan of DeFi. When, when you, let's say, you contribute to a, a liquidity pool for people to be able to borrow against you and you get the interest rate, you don't know who the other person is you know, on the other side, right? It could be a Russian oligarch for all you know that is now borrowing money <laughs> you're sitting in the world. No, seriously. This is the problem, right? Or it could be somebody in North Korea, or it could be somebody in Afghanistan. So that, and then the other things, many of these yields are given with more, you know, tokens that these companies issue. So it's a bit of a imaginary internet money being <laughs> created there to, to produce these, these yields, right? So I think that if it's very interesting, don't get me wrong, the technology, the protocols, the way they operate is, is fascinating. I think it's gonna, it's gonna kind of like come down into something that it's a bit more control in terms of, you know, KYC and AML policies implemented. So, you know, who is participating in these pools, um, you know, some, uh, you know, maybe more moderate returns because all these controls add more friction and, and it will, or, or more centralized lending and borrowing, uh, which is also possible um, that it still is much better than Bank of America, but it's not the craziness that happens in the market today. Yeah, and you guys, the DeFi banks, like for example, there you know, there's Gemini, there's Celsius, there's BlockFi. BlockFi was recently in the news because um, something with the the percentages they were giving out and the loans, like the SEC, kind of came down on them. And they remember they had to pay that hundred million dollar fine. I, I think, yeah. So first, one consideration: so Gemini or thing. what the BlockFi or what Celsius do, for the most part, is not DeFi. It's what is called CFI. It's like centralized finance because. The way those guys generate the yields is by themselves <clears throat> either investing in 
in, like, in the case of the uh, BlockFi, they were investing in grayscale um, or by, by doing centralized borrowing and lending, right? So they were like basically borrow, lending money to traders that borrow money to trade crypto. So that's not DeFi. I think that the reason the, the SEC fined BlockFi is, is threefold. They actually broke three laws or they brought a lot of laws, but in a, in a bigger scheme of things, they brought the laws. One is securities laws, because you know these, these products that these companies do where they give you a yield, which by the way, we have one product like that, is the security in the US. And whether we like it or not, that's what it is. So unless you sell it as a security with a wrapper of security, it's a fund and has to have follow securities regulations in terms of how you sell it, it has to have all, all the disclosures and all the stuff, they sell it. And BlockFi obviously was not doing that. And, and none of the others also do. The second thing is they, they brought something called the Investment Act that's a bit more technical, which basically they were buying securities with the money from the people to generate the yield. And then, you know, when you have something that contains yeah. so much money that are in securities, then you have to register as an investment company and they failed to do that. The third one to me is the most, you know, uh, I will say, uh, I don't know what word exactly to use, but <laughs> the one that gives me more pause, if you want, because they basically lie about what they were doing, right? So uh, the SEC found out that they were telling people that they were over collateralizing these loans, so it was safe, and in fact, it was not true, and, and the collaterals were declining. So, so those products that give you this six, seven percent, they're in fact very, very risky. Uh, now that you know everything has come out about how BlockFi was doing it, right? So, you know, fortunately, nobody lost money, but. You know, well, they, had to to stop, they had to stop their, um, their, you couldn't get interest on new money coming in. Yeah, now they're not allowed to take any new customers and they're not, not allowed to take any deposit for on the existing accounts until they, not, you know, regularize the situation. So they have to register the fund, they have to become an investment company, they have to, you know, stop lying to people, I guess. <laughs> so. Yeah. So do you, would you recommend more of a Gemini or a Celsius then? For like a C five, I, I you know they just seem to me that they're all doing the same, right? So none of those guys are selling these securities. None of them is giving you a document that is you know saying telling you how they generate. They are selling to retail without registering the security. So I don't know. I don't know. Maybe some of them are taking less risk. Some of them maybe are not lying to you about what they do with the money, like so BlockFi did. But from a regulatory perspective, these are all securities, and they're not selling them as securities. So I think they're all at least breaking that rule. I don't know about the other two because the other two were very specific of the case of, uh, of BlockFi. So, so what, what would you recommend? Again, this is not a financial podcast. This is not, not a financial advice. podcast. We're not giving advice, but <laughs> there's it's companies just, like our company. Yeah, that it's just are, information. Do your own research. We are not registered advisors. Yeah. So do your own research. But I'm going to ask this. Um, if somebody has cash and they kind of want to sit on some cash, but they don't want to earn negative, because of all the inflation, what's what's a good place they could put it? That's kind of a stable thing because right now it's really tether and then or the Gemini coin and then throwing it into one of these these companies. Well, we we have a, a, a subsidiary called Securitas Capital that is an, a registered investor advisor with the SEC um, that actually creates funds that are sold as securities. They are only sold to accredited investors. That's one of the you know, rules. Oh, all, oh, so you have to be an accredited investor. Yeah, that's one of the rules. When you have a fund that is not registered, you can only sell to accredited investors. This is one of the rules, by the way, that they were breaking uh, by selling to retail. If you sell to retail, the SEC, it's, it's, uh, you know, has a much more stringent process about how you can sell securities, right? So if you think about what regulators, we were talking about this at the uh, before the podcast, but one of the things regulators want is to protect the little guy, right? Because they, they're concerned of them basically uh, you know, getting a scam or investing in something that don't understand is very risky and losing their money, right? Because if someone rich loses the money, to some extent, it's their problem, right? I mean, they're rich, they have money, they, they probably have enough resources to, to get the right advice about whether they should invest in here or not, right? But if you're a retail investor, then, you know, sometimes you just see something and it looks good, but, you know, you don't know what, uh, what are you doing. So, so the regulators, for the most part, in, in all the countries, the, one of the mandates is, you know, make sure that retail investor is protected. And therefore, in the US, there's a very clear threshold. Things that are, you know, the SEC has either qualified or registered, there's different terminologies there, for certain securities offerings, that they can be sold to retail, everything else, only for accredited. 
And that's when they put the boundary. So what we sell is only for credit investors for the time being. We're looking at how to make it retail available, but uh, it will be a long process. So, um, so unfortunately, yeah. there's not that many places where you have these products today that are available in a legal way to retail. Of course, in a non-legal way, there's plenty of places where you can find them. Right. Okay. So if you if you were a retail investor, what would you be doing with your cash right now? That's a very good question. So yeah, I guess it depends on your uh, appetite for risk, right? Because uh, if you're retail, I'm assuming because you're retail, it means you don't have a lot of money. Otherwise, you are not retail. You're a creator, right? So by definition, then I understand that you know with inflation out there, it's not very appealing to keep things in cash. But um, uh, I would not also speculate too much with it because if you put it in one of these DeFi protocols, I mean, there is a you know, there's a non-zero probability that you can actually list, uh, lose it because the protocol gets hacked or because it turns out to be a, a scam or things like that. So it's, it's a bit of a risky space uh, to be in. Okay, interesting. Yeah, it, it is. I mean, that's why, like, when I was going into these, well, what I was calling DeFi, but they're actually CeFi is what you're saying. Um, and they are centralized because I remember when I was trying to take money out of BlockFi a while ago, it was Sunday and they said, you have to wait till Monday. And I'm like, what the hell? And that's when I was yeah. like, this definitely is not DeFi, right? It's not. So, <laughs> but, well, on the other hand, they did something. Thing, so they, they, they do KYC and things like that, which the DeFi companies don't do. So at least they were taking some uh, steps to, to protect the, you know, themselves from, from what they were doing. So. Yeah, no, exactly. So let's switch gears. Um, because I, when I was poking around on your website, there, Companies, startup companies come in all different products, all different shapes, all different sizes. And one of the things that really stood out to me was that there is a TV show fund. Uh -huh. So it's this, it's this TV show where people can actually buy tokens and return their funding the project. Is that correct? That's correct. Yeah. That's insane and amazing. So explain more to us about this because I'm very interested as somebody who's a, who's a creator um and have gone routes of raising money or finding sponsors for programs this was like well life-changing so let's talk about that. right so so first as we said this is not investment investment advice so this is just basically uh just explaining the one project that runs in um in our platform so we we have a broker dealer, so we are authorized to sell securities to, to people, and we are authorized to sell these securities in on the blockchain as tokens. Um, so so as, as such, what we do is, you know, we basically, there's companies that are looking at raising money, and that they think that raising money with a token from their own community is a better way of doing it, because they're kind of basically turning their community and their consumers and their funds into shareholders, and then they're going to be even more supportive of the project, and they're going to basically you know continue supporting them and promoting them etc so this is a concept which in crypto started with something called icos which was basically this community race where you will you know give people a token uh, etc <clears throat> but unfortunately what happened with icos is that for the most part they were you know illegal sale of securities because these tokens you know were basically people were buying them to speculate and to to make money not to actually use them so so the other way of doing it is you do all these kind of token offerings but you do it in a regulated way so in other words the token that <clears throat> you give to people is a security and then this security represents some sort of economic interest in the project whether it's a you know equity or a revenue share or whatever and that's a very you know uh, interesting way of raising money because you're as i mentioned you raise from your community so so the, the project you mentioned is a company called Huddle that basically is creating um, <clears throat> a TV series um, that uh, you know they do uh, crypto-related uh, episodes, right? So, so it's the whole story about uh, you know crypto, etc. So what they're doing is they're basically raising money from the community that like the TV series and that they think that um, you know they 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 want to see it and they want to fund it, so they do more episodes. I think the first one is the first one that they're kind of like uh, throwing out there. Um, and that is listed in our platform, so people can actually invest uh, on on the project. So, I mean that. So that's really cool. So, how would that work? Um, and maybe you don't know the exact answer, but if somebody, you know, let's say, let's just take a movie that's like on a bigger platform, right? And they raised, you know, let's say two million dollars uh -huh. for this movie, and they want it to be a bigger budget movie. They've got some names now. The two million dollar 
$2 million allows them to get somebody like a uh, Scarlett Johansson, let's say. She goes, oh, if you've already raised $2 million, if I jump on, there'll be even more, right? Uh -huh. And then now you have Scarlett Johansson, you got $2 million, and now you can go sell it to Universal. Mm -hmm. would that still be able to work like with that money coming in or would universal probably buy them out at that point that that's a and you might not know the answer because i don't know I yeah well i would say it doesn't matter right like it doesn't matter for universal it shouldn't matter how you raise the money right so what is your value what, what is the contractual relationship you have with the people that gave you the money right and, and if universal buys the project you know, what's going to happen with that money? Do you have to pay them out? Do you have to give them a revenue share or things like that? In this case of this TV series, HODL, the way it's structured is very, it's actually very simple. So they, they give you these tokens, they raise uh, X amount of money. I don't remember the total amount. And then for the first season, 100% of the profits go back to the token holders. 100% of the profits. Like the second season, only 50% of the profits. And the third and onwards, they give you only 25%. So you're basically helping them fund the, 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 the launch, right? Because once this becomes, you know, popular, and it, the, I remember they were talking, saying this, this, this whole TV series will be similar to what Silicon Valley was to tech. You remember the TV yeah, series? Yeah, yeah, of Valley? course. Or, or Entourage was for, for entertainment business, right? So then, yeah. you know, they, they can, you raise them, they raise the money, they give you, you know, profits at the beginning, and then over time, they give you less and less profits, so they get the profits themselves to reinvest in, in more, uh, you know, seasons, so. Well, that's cool. so. Where is where can you watch the first episode of this? At the single person, I don't know if it's available yet. I know that they did this because I remember when they launched with us. I I, I saw that they were uh, you know already having like the, the script for the first episode and or or the pilot. Um, I think the pilot is available, and I'm not sure about the, the the first episode yet. So. So this could almost be like the future of movies and television. I think it's the future as you know, we're going back to you know what we discussed at the beginning of this being the long tail of capital markets, right? Uh, if you think about it, it's absurd that only people, certain companies with their certain size, they have access to capital, right? Anybody should have access to capital and anybody should be able to find the, the, the niche group of people that want to finance them, right? So uh, so this yeah. this technology basically allows anybody to use tokens and use stable coins and things like that to basically raise money from their audience like it could be like you know i think of a day when you know you go to a restaurant and you really like the restaurant and then you have a qr code there on the table and say okay instead of giving me a tip i'm gonna actually buy a little bit of equity in this restaurant and you go there with your crypto wallet you know a qr code you very simply take a picture of your id do kyc and then send 50 dollars in usdc and then get a token that gives you you own 50 dollars in equity in this restaurant now and it's your favorite restaurant and you know, that token also you can use it to maybe get a discount in the happy hour and the next day you go and buy more because you want the restaurant to be successful and you recommend it to your friends. So, so that's, uh, that's what I think is going to happen. I mean, that's, a, that's, that's great. That's absolutely great because I think so many people were restricted. Yeah, for, for yourself. So, so look, if you suppose you want to raise money now for doing, you know, I don't know, because you need a bigger production studio or because you want to do more shows and stuff like that. You can either go to a bank and then, you know, borrow money or you can try to go to a VC, but, you know, some business, unless they are like big enough and the potential multiple stuff is big enough, VCs and they're going to touch it. Or, or where are you going to get capital from? <clears throat> so, but, you know, you have a, you, you're very popular, obviously, you have a very good show and you have an audience and, and I'm pretty sure people want you to continue producing the show, right? And, um, and then, you know, if you, there's a simple way for you to raise money from them and give them also participation on, on the upside of your business and you raise money, that's a win-win for everybody. No, absolutely. I mean, because uh, my, my mind is just spinning right now because I'm like, oh, there's so many different things. And the other thing too is I always believe that every single person is sitting on one great idea, right? But the reason that hardly any of them start is because they don't know, well, how am I going to find the money to do it? You know, I need 5,000 for this, sure. I need 10,000 for this. I can't ask my friends and family, or I don't know rich people, or I don't know what to do. And guess what happens? That idea never goes anywhere, and it stays right in the brain, which is useless. So it's almost like this could allow smaller companies with a great, solid idea to be able to really raise money and gain traction. 
So, so the origin of this is comes from 2014, actually, before crypto was popular. I mean, crypto. What, Sorry, uh, that again comes from what project? Yeah, from 2014. In 2014, when when Obama was president in the U.S., he passed a law called the Jumpstart the, our Small Business, the Jobs Act. Um, so this Jobs Act, basically, what it wanted to do was to facilitate that people could raise money. Uh, small businesses could raise money from anybody including retail people. So they passed this, this uh, crowdfunding rules called REXIF um, that, you know, have been to somehow popular, but you could only raise $1 million, you know, and there was a lot of friction if you want in the process, etc. I think what, what, what has happened the last couple of years, which is fascinating, is that first, you know, the, the threshold of REXIF went from 1 million to 5 million. Mm -hmm. So it makes it more attractive to people. And then second, the whole idea of you know, crypto wallets and stable coins and stuff like that and tokens, it just simplifies the entire process of, you know, funding and receiving the equity and, and keeping the equity and everything. So it has basically streamlined the process, right? So we're very excited. We're doing one uh, with a customer now that, uh, that they have, you can actually do um, what is called test the waters. So before even you go into the racing process, you can see whether there's enough interest uh, from your community to invest and you can just they can just go to a portal and then tell you yes i'd like to invest a thousand dollars five thousand dollars and then you do the actual race after so there's a lot of tools that are kind of new if you want um that that come from this you know slow changes in securities reg regulations the last few years that i think are going to explode in the future well i mean this is just exciting it's it's revolutionary is really what it is yeah like internet was yeah <laughs> right <laughs> Yes, the future is scary, but it is also very bright. And I think it's all about our attitude and our positivity. So if you're sitting on an idea or you wish you could start something, well, you could be dead tomorrow. So start today. That's <laughs> my advice to people, right? Um, no, this is amazing. You and I should talk a little bit further offline um, about some stuff. But yeah, this is, this is really, really good stuff. I just want to go in before we kind of wrap up i just want you to tell us about um on your one of the products you guys offer is a bitcoin and an ethereum yield fund mm -hmm. so how is that different from like is this people can just buy their bitcoin on let's say coinbase transfer it into this yield fund and then earn the market appreciation value or depreciation plus 2.5 percent api is that correct that's correct. Well, we actually take fiat, so you don't have to buy the Bitcoin. We'll buy the Bitcoin for you. So we have three products, basically. We have a USDC yield fund, which is denominated in a stable coin, which is the, the one that we were talking before, which is an alternative. That's you have to be accredited right now, right? The, the two of them have to be accredited. They are all for accredited investors. Oh, so USD. Yeah, yeah. Because these are, yeah, these are funds, these are actual securities. So, okay. so we have like three, the USDC denominated, the Bitcoin denominated, the ETH denominated. And then the two of them, you give us fiat um, and then like let's say dollars, hundred thousand dollars, and then we go on purchase in one case USDC, in some other case Bitcoin, in some other case um, ETH, and then we do centralized lending <clears throat> to generate the yield. And typically the highest yield it's the is on USDC and then ETH and then Bitcoin. So in USDC, I think that the the, the one we've been publishing until now is around nine point five percent and ETH I think is two point something and Bitcoin is two point something. So oh, but they we, don't we, actually we, own the Bitcoin in there. No, so they if don't. I gave you forty thousand dollars, just you can that's what Bitcoin's at. I don't own a Bitcoin. I just own forty thousand of that fund. You own forty thousand dollars in depending if you buy if you, we do we do USDC. You own forty thousand dollars in USDC plus a let's say nine percent APY. If you invest on the Bitcoin one, we'll purchase Bitcoin at, the, at that point in time, and then you'll own forty thousand dollars in Bitcoin with whatever change in Bitcoin price happens plus two point five percent of additional Bitcoin every year. Okay, gotcha. So it's not the actual coin, but it's the fund that's based off the price of the coin plus the year. Correct, exactly. Yeah. Okay, correct. gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. And then, so the USD funds around nine percent. Is that what you just said? Yeah, it's between eight to nine percent, I think. Is there a friends and family if I don't have a million dollars to give you? <laughs> no, I think the minimum. I think we started with the minimum investment is fifty thousand dollars. Oh, so it's not too crazy. It's not too crazy, and we think about lowering a little bit, but uh, how secure is it? Well, so these are all so so these are loans that are uh, you know 
over collateralized or largely collateralized, right? So, yeah. uh, of course, it's not as secure as keeping the money in cash, <laughs> but but it's pretty secure and it's pretty secure. transparent, right? Like there is a document there that you can read about what we do exactly. We, there, there's a fund admin that calculates the NAV uh, independently, uh, so it tells you the the return that we're getting from the loans. There is a, a, a an auditor of the fund, so these are securities, right? So these are regulated products. Obviously, we have to be uh, extra careful about disclosures and things like that. So. Okay, well, very, I mean, this is all very interesting stuff. So, yeah, because I know um, it's interesting, like, with the whole, you know, Bitcoin Bitcoin and Ethereum thing, if you understand the markets and you're kind of used to, you know, shuffling in between exchanges and pulling them off exchanges and putting them into either cold storage or hard storage, buying the coin is, like, is perfect for you and you just want to ride the, the coin. But for people like you know, for example, my dad's generation, my mom's generation, the baby boomers, they originally went into GBTC. And I was like, don't do that. You're never going to get the appreciation. But they wanted something where they could call their advisor, get into something where they still had, you know, a Bitcoin or an Ethereum advantage. Because if you told them like, oh, no, just go get a ledger and then pull it off the hardware wallet, you have the address, you can always add more to it, go sign up for a vault that scans your retina to get in, and you can keep it there and nobody can ever take it. And if should, if you need to disappear, you can actually lube up the ledger and put it up your butthole and leave. That's what was really cool about that. This is still a comedy podcast, so don't be horrified. <laughs> That's why I love hardware storage. Yeah. Look, this what our product is to some extent is like GBTC with two main differences. One is instead of two percent fees, we only charge zero point five percent, which is a major difference because GBTC yeah. it's two percent every year because they they keep the I fees. Won't touch GB- I don't like GBTC. I'm like, Ugh. and then on top of that, they, we actually give you a yield on Bitcoin on top of it, right? So so the, the net, if you look at the charts of you know a hundred dollar investment in GBTC versus a hundred dollar investment in our fund, we're going to outperform for sure, right? Yeah. Because both both contain Bitcoin. So if Bitcoin goes up and down, we're going to fluctuate in the same direction, but we're going to be charging less fees. So over time, you'll have more money, and then on top of that, we'll give you the yield. So right, exact, exact. I like I love that. So that makes it a little more understandable. And so so they have in order to get into this fund, the only way to do it is to go to Securitize.io fill out a KYC and then they can invest directly on the That's site. Correct. Yep. So the funds are there. If, if there is a product, we have some products that are for retail people, then those, they will not ask you for accreditation. If you go to a product that is for accrediting investors, they'll ask you for accreditation. And then once you pass accreditation, um, you, then after that, this, this, all this KYC and, and accreditation information stays with your security ID. So once you've done it once, you can then do, use any of everything in our platform with the same security ID without having to repeat it again, which is another huge advantage. Exactly. And for all my crypto nerds out there, I'm one of them. Remember KYC means they know you're on ramp. <laughs> <laughs> so as I say, do you, can you find, cause there's still places where you could actually buy, buy certain coins without having to verify your on ramp. Your KYC is your on ramp. Well, on, on DeFi, in any DeFi protocol, you just connect your MetaMask wallet and that's it, right? So you're off. yeah, exa- exactly. So yes, for my crypto nerds, people, when they hear KYC, they're like, Ugh, I don't want to, <laughs> but. Well, look, this is not true. Like I remember, I remember when, when centralized exchanges didn't have KYC. I do remember in 2016, there was a bunch of places where you could create a, an account with an email and a password. And that's it, and buy Bitcoin. And that, you know, disappeared over time, right? And that didn't make crypto, you know, uh, small. This is the opposite. More people enter because the more of this investor protection stuff, there more, more, you know, traditional people feel comfortable with the asset class, right? Oh. Not everybody wants to, not to do KYC because you can get in trouble, right? Like you don't know who you're trading with. And so you can get scammed. And so I don't think that this is necessarily bad. So. No, KYCs are not bad. I just think it's funny because my friends and I were talking about the IRS clamping down and it was like, oh, well, do they have traction of your on-ramp? Where yeah, of course, on-ramp? if you want to evade taxes, KYC is not a good idea. Not a good idea. Right, exactly. <laughs> you're doing something but, illegal, so that's up to you. So. <laughs> right, but you're, you're less likely to, get to, you should just, you could steal a Louis Vuitton bag and get out of jail, but if you evade taxes, they'll probably keep you in there longer than a murderer. So I, I highly suggest that you do not go that route. There's plenty of tax loopholes. Uh, we're going to have some tax advice episodes coming up that are completely legal and can really, really benefit you from, from paying the least amount of taxes as possible. So, so 
always good to stay legal, but always know your loopholes because you could be missing out on money that you are giving to the government, which we all know doesn't know how to spend money. So keep your money. <laughs> so, okay, well, this was amazing. So tell us, repeat again where we can find you, where we can find more information, your Twitter. So you can find me at, Car at Carlos Domingo at Twitter. Uh, you can find me there every day because I'm pretty, uh, you know, <laughs> active on Twitter. You yeah. can find our company at Securitize.io or at, uh, you know, at Securitize at Twitter. Um, and from there, you will get access to most of our news and information. So. Okay, well, perfect. Well, this was great. Thank you so much for coming on. Well, no, thanks for the invite. This, uh, yeah. I really enjoyed it. This is, I mean, this is amazing, you guys. I, I'm super excited about this. I'm sure you guys are. Everybody wants to get in on something before it explodes. That's how the real wealth is created. So this could be your opportunity. Again, this is not financial advice. This is simply information. Do your own research. Take your own risk. But remember, life without risk is not very fun. So have fun. <laughs> anyway, thanks for listening to another episode of Next to Madison. And we'll see you next time to find out who's next. Hey, your host here, Madison Malloy. Please make sure to subscribe to the show on all podcast platforms and please rate and review us on iTunes and Spotify. Also, if you have any questions or comments, you can email us at contact at I thank you again for listening. Bye.